Well, we're in this series in the book of Revelation. Say it with me, will you? What in the world is happening? One more time. We're only going to be here another week or two, and then we'll, we'll move on from the book of Revelation. And just as a reminder, it's not simply a book about future events. It is a book about the revelation of Jesus Christ. What God is wanting to do is to give us an understanding of who Jesus is. Because everything was created by him. Everything is going to come back to him. Everything is going to be done through him until Jesus hands the kingdom back to the Father. Everything is going to be about Jesus. And just let me say to you that in our walk with God, regardless of what has happened in your life, regardless of what will happen in your life, regardless of what is going on right now, let me remind us we want to see Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want to understand Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Everything about life is about Jesus. As a matter of fact, the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is not just a collection of stories, but it is the story of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the story of, of the Bible, and Jesus is the story of history. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I heard somebody say it one time, it's Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the afternoon, Jesus in the evening. It's Jesus all day long. Just let me tell you, life is about Jesus, and anything disconnected from him is disconnected from life. <laughs> Okay. Can anybody say amen to that today? So we're not just talking about future things. It is about Jesus. Jesus wants to be revealed in your family. He wants to be revealed in your marriage. He wants to be revealed in your kids. He wants to be revealed in your job. He wants to be revealed in your future. Everything about our lives when Jesus is in the center of it is fixed because Jesus gets involved in everything if we want him there, right? So we began in the book and we said the book of Revelation primarily follows a chronological order. And that outline is in Revelation 1, the things which were, the things which are, the things which shall be, the things which were. Revelation 1, where John sees the vision of Jesus, the things which are, the age of the churches, Revelation 2 and 3, and the things which shall be, Revelation 4 and beyond. And we talked about Revelation 4 with the appearing of Jesus in what we refer to as the rapture of the church when Jesus comes for his believers, for his saints, as the Bible calls it. And remember, there's a difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus. Don't confuse the terms. The rapture is when Jesus comes back for his church. The second coming is when Jesus comes back with his church. Okay. And then we discuss from Revelation 5 and on the opening of those seven seals that reveal certain things that are going to take place. And the opening of the seven seals then would open up the seven trumpets, then would open up the seven vile or bold judgments. If you want to know about that, go back and watch the prior messages as we talked about that. And there's something that caught my attention in Revelation chapter 9, and I want us to go there for a moment because it was a particular word that I believe is exactly what we're seeing right now. And so I want, I want you to, I want to read these, these, these scriptures together because that particular word is used four times in the book of Revelation, and it is the word sorcery. Everybody say that with me, sorcery. Now, now when we think of sorcery, we, we think of this. We think about witches around a cauldron. Okay, now that, that may be part of the word sorcery, but, but that's not really what the book of Revelation is trying to reveal to us. And so, Go to the text with me for a moment because the word is used four times in the book of Revelation. And, and here they are, the first one, and this is the one that caught my attention, but the people who did not die in these plagues. Now remember, in Revelation 9, it's a number of things that are taking place in the world, serious things. And it says the people who did not die in these plagues, this is interesting, still refuse to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. One of the purposes 
of what is called the tribulation period or Jacob's trouble is to root out the final stages of rebellion against God. And so now you have all these things taking place on the earth and they still refuse to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continue to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that can neither see nor hear nor walk. And watch this. We get the four big, what we would call the four big sins of the final day. Okay? And they would not repent of their murders or their, here's the word, witchcraft or sorcery. It's the same word in the original language. We'll talk about it in a moment. They would not repent of their murders, their witchcraft or sorcery, or their sexual immorality, or their theft. So you have the four big issues of the final day. And then in chapter 18, the word is used again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. And I'll talk about that in a moment. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and you deceived the nations with your, say it with me. Now watch this, another text here. Chapter 21, verse number 8, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice, here it is, witchcraft or sorcery, idol worshipers and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And then one more time in Revelation chapter 22, verse number 15, outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers. And he's speaking about outside of the city of Jerusalem, outside of the people who know the Lord. Outside are the dogs or the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love, underscore this phrase, all who love to live a lie. So when we talk about this word sorcery, it is the Greek term, some of you know this, it is the Greek term pharmakia, Okay, and I don't give you a lot of Greek words, but I just want to hang out on this word for, for the rest of the message. It's where we get our word pharmacy from. Now, that's a very simplistic definition because the original language, when John was writing this in the first century, okay, the, the word pharmakia actually had multiple implications in its meaning, and that's one of the beauties of the Greek language. Is, is that it has multiple ways that a particular word is described, okay? And so, so the first definition of the word in its most simplest form is the use or the administering of drugs. Now, we know in America right now we have uh, an over-the-counter addiction problem with drugs. We have a prescription drug addiction problem, and we know that we have an illegal drug addiction problem. And what the writer here, what John is trying to help us understand is that in the final day, there would be an unrestrained use of drugs, of over-the-counter prescription and illegal drugs. Now, I realize that there are some on the extreme side of this, and just to clarify, that would say, well, we, we should never use uh, any kind of drugs for healing. Well, that would be an extreme view. We just need to all stay natural. Well, I'm not opposed to natural uses of drugs, but I have to tell you something. Just let me underscore this for those that might have an extreme view. Uh, if God didn't want us using doctors, then the Holy Spirit would not have had a physician named Luke write two books in the New Testament. <laughs> okay. So we understand that there are certain drugs that have helped us. We've all had certain issues in our life, maybe uh, infections and other things, even all the way over to cancer, where certain drugs have assisted us in getting better. So that's not really what uh, John is talking about here, but he is referring to drugs that take control, and we'll talk about that word witchcraft later in terms of its actual meaning. But so, just to keep it simple, and its basic meaning, when John is writing here, he is saying that in the final day, 
drug use is going to be rampant. As a matter of fact, in Catawba County right now, Catawba County in the United States, if you look at the statistics, is one of the top opioid addictive places in America, if you look at the research um, that has recently been given out. And so we understand that particular word, pharmacia, the use or administering of drugs. But then the word actually goes in into to a deeper meaning. And so when John was writing in the first century, let me give you this, this additional meaning as, as the word is opened up. It means this. The use of materials, practices, or mind-altering drugs or activities to create, watch this, a spiritual experience for personal benefit or health, wisdom, or knowledge, or to manipulate and control someone else's behavior, emotions, or feelings, as in the case of casting spells or creating uh, potions. Okay, this includes... Zodiac signs, horoscopes, tarot cards, Ouija boards, Kundalini yoga, Reiki, fortune telling, palm reading, crystals, stones, smudging, dream captures, communicating with the dead, affirmations of romance, my, my crush is going to be obsessed with me, spells, books, chakra alignments, shamans, uh, divination, levitation, uh, Wicca, tea leaf readings, uh, tassology, cleansing rit rituals, etc., 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 all of that falls under the category of John's definition of what this word pharmakia or sorcery means. Now, let me illustrate this to help us understand what we're talking about. When I was in India, uh, my wife and I were there in 2019 in November, and we were taken to two specific locations where human trafficking was extremely rampant. And let me show you this picture here because uh, there's two things I want you to see about this. Number one, on, on, on the left-hand side, uh, this was one of the areas we went into, and you can't see it in the picture. But one thing that I noticed when we got out of the car and we began walking into that particular area, it was covered. And when I say covered, I don't mean a few I mean thousands and probably millions, they were thick with flies. Flies were everywhere. I'm not talking about, you know, I hate to have a fly in the house. What about you? Okay, like, and I'm not very good at killing them. Okay, I flick at them. My wife says I flick at them. Okay, because uh, I'm not extremely coordinated, right? And so I, I try to hit them. And I actually, I got to tell you a story. I actually caught one in my hand the other day. It was flying by and went, boop. I got it. It's the first time in my life I've ever done that. Probably the last time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Give me a, give me some applause there. Okay. This area was covered, blanketed in flies, and that was significant because remember, one of the names for Satan is Beelzebub or Lord of the Flies. And they represented the demonic activity that was going on in the area. And that gate there is the gate that goes into where many of these rooms are located at with multiple beds in them. And they lock the girls in so they cannot get out. Okay. And so it became a very visible picture on the outward of thousands of flies of what was really going on in the spiritual world. Now, when you use Pharmakia's definition and actually John's definition of the word about using certain things to create spiritual experiences, okay, there are multiple groups around the world right now that are, even in this area, that are using powders, um, other types of things to create supernatural experiences. Let's, let's take a look at this for a moment. Baby. 
And so these powders are put up people's noses or there are drops that go in people's eyes. You say, well, people get better. Okay, let me tell you. Do you want to get better by the hand of the Lord or a hand of a demon? Okay. So, so then you have individuals that are using breathing techniques in order to create a spiritual experience. Or maybe some of you are more familiar with this. When God and Leviosa. God. Stop, stop, stop. You're going to take someone's eye out. Besides, you're saying it wrong. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. You do it then if you're so clever. Go on, go on. Guardian Leviosa. Guardian Leviosa. When Guardian Leviosa. Oh, well done. See here, everyone. This great has done it. Oh, splendid. Thank God, Leviosa. Well done, Thank dear. God. I think we're going to need another feather over here, Professor. Now, I realize that some people would say, seriously, Pastor, this is witchcraft. This is how... Pharmacia is defined, and I know we have this, oh, we have the books in our home, we have the movies, it's not that big of a deal. They're teaching our children how to cast spells, and it is shocking to me the numbers of American believers who call themselves spirit-filled who think that this is okay. You are opening up the door of your home to sorcery. Or maybe you might have seen this. Hey, what's up? I'm Tony Hawk, and I recently became an ambassador for Liquid Death Mountain Water. Apparently, I didn't read the fine print, and now Liquid Death officially owns my soul and my blood, too. I don't know. It's very confusing. They're taking my blood, and we're going to use it for skateboard graphics. So they're going to mix my blood into the paint and do a limited run of skateboards using my real blood in the graphics. But some of the profits would go towards killing plastic pollution and to building skate parks in underserved communities. Yeah, so I guess go to liquiddeath.com to get skateboards with my blood in it. So wait, if you have my blood, that means you have my DNA. Get the Liquid Death skateboard infused with 100% real Tony Hawk today. Wow, you can own your very own piece of Birdman, but hurry. Supplies so if you don't know who Tony Hawk is, he's a famous skateboarder, and so they've, they've taken his blood and they mixed it with the paint of this limited edition of, of skateboards. Okay, so that is defined as, say it with me, sorcery. Okay. So, and I know we've told you before about various things that we have found in our parking lot, like in the back of the parking lot, like chicken heads and things that have been chopped off, placed behind um, a parking block, uh, which is interesting because that's at the border of the parking lot, and it's almost as though whoever is doing this is saying, no more, we're not going to let them expand anymore. I just want to say we're expanding in the power of Jesus Christ. And, and there is no curse. The Bible says that an undeserved curse cannot come to rest. And, and for those that do attend this church periodically, and you may be here today that are part of the Wiccan church, we just, God commands you to repent. Uh, because there is no power greater than the power of Jesus Christ. Okay? And that power is able to free somebody from the bondages of darkness. So you have all of this, particularly this time of year, and some of you may not recognize it, but during the Halloween time, 
on All Hallows' Eve, there are more child sacrifices that take place in America than in any other time of the year. There are individuals, they're, they're called breeders, they're women, they are simply there to make babies for child sacrifice. Now, I understand that some of us who have sensitive consciences are saying, you know what, I just can't believe that kind of stuff. You know what, there's a lot of things that, that are difficult to believe for people with some sense about them. But remember, we are living in a world, an evil world, that has a very clear agenda in order to be able to do evil things. And just because you may not be evil doesn't mean that we don't need to recognize that we are surrounded by evil, okay? So you have the first definition of the word pharmakia, and then you have the second definition of the word, word that, that attempts to create spiritual experiences through whatever means uh, there might be. And then there is this uh, third definition, and, and this is another side of the word pharmakia. It refers to, and this is all coming uh, from the Greek text, okay, the deceptions and seductions of idolatry. Now, I want you to go with me for a moment to the book of Galatians, um, chapter number 5, and, and I want you to see what this says. Now, Paul is going to speak here about the works of the flesh, okay? Everybody say that with me, the works of the flesh, okay? So, so notice what he says here. Whenever you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the works of the flesh, the results are very clear, okay? Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, and notice this, he will place idolatry and sorcery or witchcraft, same word again, he will place them together, idolatry and witchcraft are connected together, and then he goes on to describe other things, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's talking here about the works of the flesh, okay? And how many in the room say, you know what? I have flesh, right? These are the works of the flesh as contrasted with the fruit of the Spirit, okay? Which Paul will go on to describe. So here's my question. Witchcraft, sorcery, is listed as a work of the flesh. So then how does something that is a work of the flesh actually become spiritual and supernatural? How, how does that happen? Well, Paul's going to describe it. And when you start comparing Scripture with Scripture, you begin to understand and open up what the Word of God is actually trying to teach us. So he's speaking to the Corinthian church in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 10. And he says this, what am I trying to say? And he's speaking to a cultural thing uh, about food being sacrificed to idols because that was very common in that day. He says, am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying, now keep in mind, he's speaking to their culture. We're going to speak to ours in a moment. No, I'm saying that these sacrifices are offered to, to who? Okay, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You can't drink from the cup of the Lord. And the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. So notice what he's saying here. Something that is very natural. Hunger. So you get this guy in the first century. Yeah, I don't care what Paul's got to say about it. I'm just going to eat the food. It doesn't matter to me. And, and because... Remember, any natural desire, we all have natural desires. Look at somebody and say, you have natural desires. Okay? How do you define a work of the flesh? It is a natural desire that is out of control. So he says, you have a natural desire here, but be careful. 
Because when that natural desire gets out of control, then it becomes supernatural. What is he saying here? Is that when they lean into their flesh, and this is exactly what Paul is saying, is that they begin to entertain demons. This is what he said. I don't want you to participate with demons in something as simple as eating food sacrificed to idols. So let's fast forward to 21, 2021. It's just a little bit of porn. No, it is food sacrificed to idols. And it becomes demonic. Any act of the flesh, and we're not just talking about something that might be sexual. We're talking about any act of the flesh because go back and look at the list there. Anger, jealousy, divisions, etc., etc. Okay? When any act of the flesh becomes out of control, and this is what Paul is trying to teach here to the Corinthian church in the 1 Corinthians 10 passage. Our acts of the flesh actually become movie screens where demons get their popcorn and their Coke and watch us and participate with it. This is how demons begin to demonize Christians. Because any door of the flesh that is left open becomes an opportunity for an act of the flesh to become an invitation for darkness to invade. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor. Everything is not a demon. I agree with you 100%. Everything is not a demon. The problem, however, for many Christians is that they have so many open doors that they are under the spirit of sorcery and don't even know it, and they need deliverance. Remember the definition of witchcraft. Let me give you a one word definition of it. It's called control or manipulation. So think about this. Is it sorcery to have private conversations with people that demean other people's character? When we talk about our employers, when we talk about our church leaders, when we talk about family members, friends, remember that a gossip is a sorcerer. Is it sorcery to roam from church to church without being able to make a long-term commitment to a group of believers and think you're God's gift to the body of Christ? Is it sorcery the amount of church division and lack of unity in Catawba County? Is it sorcery to try and persuade people to leave one church to go to another church? Is it sorcery for husbands and wives to use sex as a weapon to manipulate behavior? Is it sorcery to say publicly on social media what we won't say privately to those we're referring to? Is it sorcery to think all these things don't open up doors? And is it sorcery to mandate people to have to get a vaccine or lose their job? The answer is yes, it is. You say, I'm not sure that I agree with that. Well, listen to what Paul said to the Galatian church who was challenged in their walk with God. He said this, oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. And notice he says, who has cast an evil spell on you? Not what? Because a lot of us are listening to people and things that are speaking into our ears and we don't even realize that we are coming underneath the influence of sorcery. Because any desire of anyone to, manip to manipulate and control someone else's behavior is sorcery. So, what are we to do? What are, how are we to manage this? So, Revelation 17 will say some things here that will help us understand where we're at and what in the world is happening right now. 
So one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, remember those seven bowls were seven types of judgments that were poured out on the earth. Come, I'll show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters with her, watch this, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit to a wilderness. Remember, in the Bible, the wilderness is a place that is void of the presence of God. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. It was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Now, what is he describing here? John is describing the false religious, governmental, political, and social system that God in the final end will wipe out. We are living right now with a false religious, political, and social system. Now watch Revelation 18, and this is where the light came on for me. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, just like this, the great city of Babylon. And remember, we're talking in a spiritual sense. Babylon always represents the ways of the world, not the ways of God. Will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. And remember, literal Babylon was located in Iraq. So again, we're over in the Middle East. You have the contrast of Iraq and Israel, the place where the presence of God is supposed to dwell, versus Babylon that is opposed to the presence of God. And you always have these two things. This is why the Bible talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. He says the fruit of the, or the power of the Holy Spirit is always working against the power of the flesh, and the power of the flesh is always working against the power of the Holy Spirit. And so how do I overcome the works of the flesh? Or Babylon, I I must submit myself to Jesus and the presence of the Lord and everything in my life must come under the lordship of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Okay, and then he says this. I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people. Come out of this. Come out of this influence of sorcery. Come out of the influence of Babylon. Come out of this. Look at somebody and say, come out. The sound of harps and singers and flutes and trumpets will never be heard in you again. Okay, so now he's talking about the judgment that's coming on this false system. No craftsman and no trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of the mill will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. And this is where the light came on for me with all of this. He said, for your merchants were the greatest in the world and you deceived the nations with your sorceries. Let me tell you what is happening right now taking place all across this world right now. People are believing things that are lies because America has been, and the world, has been pharmakeaed or drugged with lies. And we are under the influence of sorcery all around the world. Think about this for a moment. You saw this a few weeks ago where the vice president was interviewing a group of students, school students, about space and other things, as many times political leaders do. Come to find out, they were all child actors. 
to manipulate the appearance that these kids were very engaged. They were acting. You probably saw this where now the, the White House has its own set that looks like a White House across the street. I think it's in the Eisenhower building from the White House where it makes it look like it's in the White House, but it really isn't. Now, I get for those that are in, in uh, media and things, well, the lighting can be right, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I understand all of that, but I need you to understand with me right now, what you're seeing all across the world is a movie screen, not reality. Okay. Because we are under a spirit of sorcery. The goal is to manipulate and control. And doggone it, I refuse to submit to it. So what is the answer? Is there an answer? There is. How do you deal with this personally? Because I know that we all want to run and do something. It begins individually first. Because the church needs to shop, stop shouting at the world until we fix ourselves. Okay? So listen to what Paul said. Paul is again writing to the Corinthian church. And he will say this. This is 2 Corinthians, his second book. He's dealing, now in the context, when you read it, the context of 2 Corinthians has to do with super or false apostles. They were coming against the apostle Paul. And they were appearing to be one thing when they were another. And this is what Paul tells. He says this is how he functions. He said, since God has so generously let us in on what he is doing, Watch this. We're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. Look at somebody and say right now, I refuse to give up. So just because things get a little rough, just because things get a little tough, whatever it is in your family, in your marriage, in your business or whatever, look at somebody and say, get some doggone backbone. <laughs> Look at him and say, stop giving up so easily. Stop giving in to everything, everything. Here's what he said. Here it is. This is for us individually. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We will not come under sorcery, or use it ourselves. We don't watch, we don't maneuver. You know what? The Bible is so relevant to our lives today. Well, the Bible is just an old book. It doesn't have anything to say to us today. Then you haven't read the Bible. <laughs> we don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. We don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Here it is. Rather, stop yelling at the world. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open. The whole truth on display so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. What is he saying here? He's saying stop the religious games and let's start to live in truth. Because we cannot yell at a culture that's living a lie when we are living one ourselves. I appreciate that one. Amen. Appreciate that one clap. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Okay, good. Good. The Lord's writing that down in heaven now, sister. He, he just wrote that down. She clapped. Praise God. So 
So let's take our eyes for a minute off everything that's frustrating you. And let's put the magnifying glass right here in our own lives. Well, it would be good for us. Maybe you haven't read a verse in the Bible this week. It's a good idea to read the Bible once in a while. You know, it's just a good idea. It's quite helpful. Why don't we read this together? Um, Jared, come to keys. Let's read this together. Here we go. Ready? Go. Since God has so generously led us in on what he is doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes, and we don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth on display, so that those who want to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. Stand with me right now. Can we just take a moment and let's just lift our hands toward the Lord and just take a moment and worship him here and then we'll see what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we just honor you in the room right now. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For the Lord would say unto you today, Can you hear my word? Can you hear my call? Do you understand what is taking place right now before your very eyes? I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out of your ways. I'm calling you out of yourself. I'm calling you out of your flesh. I'm calling you out of manipulation. I'm calling you out of the sorceries that have influenced your life. And I'm calling you to a place of brokenness and tenderness and repentance with me. For I'm saying to you today, hear the word of the Lord. Do not be deceived. Do not be entrapped. 
And do not be entangled by the spirit of this age, but be freed by my spirit so that you know what it is to live clean, to live in freedom, to live in hope, to live in strength. You don't have to live in a struggle and a bondage any longer. I'm calling you out today. Remove yourself and open up your eyes and listen to my voice, says the Lord. What you have just heard is found in the book of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. That is what is called a message in tongues in an interpretation in the known language. It is biblical. And it is the Holy Spirit placing the seal of his approval on his word. Listen. Not his seal of approval on me, the seal of his approval on his word. And he is asking you and me to humble ourselves and come out of this cloud of sorcery that we have been living under and see and hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to his church. If you have any sense of conviction and what is that, it's that the Spirit of God, you know, is talking to you, saying, man, I feel like I need to do something. You don't even maybe know, know what you need to do. An altar is a place of humility in coming before the Lord and surrendering. If there is anyone in this room right now that feels like a complete surrender to Jesus you need to do. I want you to get out of your seat and come and humble yourself before the presence of God at the front of this altar right now and acknowledge I'm coming out of this stuff that I have been under and I will submit myself to Christ. And you're praying, God, open my eyes Open my ears, open my family, open my heart, open myself. I will not participate in the sorceries of this world any longer. Get out of your seat and come right now. Come on. Get out of your seat and come and kneel at this altar without any music or anything. I'm going to humble myself in this room today and just talk to Jesus and just talk to the Lord. If you have to go, thank you for being here. We love you. But this is a holy moment right now when the Spirit of God is calling this church to come out of its sorceries, to come out of its manipulation, for you to come out of stuff. And your words, and your gossip, and your attitude, and your attempts to control your family, and your husband, and your wife, or your kids or the opinions of other people. The Lord is calling you out of that right now. He's calling you out of that right now. And I want the rest of us to begin to call on the Lord and ask for the revelation of Jesus Christ in our lives and our families and this nation's. Somebody has got to pray, folks. Somebody has got to pray. May the spirit of prayer come across this congregation right now. Come on. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus.